your tongue, kiddo. The Easy Bake Oven is a working toy oven introduced in 1963. What's crazy is that the original toy used a light bulb as a heat source to heat up your food in this oven. But then years later, they put an actual heating element into the oven. 500,000 Easy Bake Ovens were sold in the first year it came out, which is crazy. And then by 1997, 16 million more had sold. So I can't even imagine how many were sold sold up until 2017. I think they stopped making them after 2017. The oven comes with packets of cake mix and small round pans. After water is added to the mix in the pan, it is pushed into the oven through a slot. After cooking, the cake is pushed out through a slot on the other end. So the reason why this Easy Bake Oven took off so quickly was because no one had ever seen an oven that kids could use, right? Because ovens and children don't really go well together, it's a bit dangerous. So when parents saw that this was actually a safe thing for their kid to use, they were like, oh my gosh, let's get it. In the end, it wasn't the most safe thing, but we're gonna talk about that in a second. So let's get into some of the interesting facts. So in 2002, they tried to come out with an Easy Bake Oven for boys, and this failed miserably. There was a huge controversy around it. It just didn't do well. In 2002, they released a more masculine version of this oven called the Queasy Bake Cooker. The Queasy Bake Cookerator. What? I love how they say a more masculine version as if it's not okay for a guy to just use the one they had before. Can't kids just decide what they want to play with? This allowed boys to make unappetizing recipes like mud and crud cakes and drip and drool dog bones. So this boy Easy Bake Oven just allowed them to make really gross stuff. This was discontinued very soon after it was released because no one was buying it. People were confused. Boys didn't want to use it. It just didn't do well at all. And it was just controversial because people didn't get why there needed to be a pretty pink and purple one and then a gross drooly slime one for boys. Why did it have to be such opposites? The next fact is that in 2012, they came out with a gender neutral Easy Bake Oven, which is something that I can actually vibe with. There was this petition that was made by a teenage girl in 2012 to have this company make a gender neutral one. And this teenage girl got so many signatures, it was actually amazing, that they actually came out with one. It says they released a black, silver, and blue toy oven after meeting with this teen because at the time the Easy Bake Oven was only available in pink and purple. So people just found it so appalling that boys were never used in any promotional materials. They were never in commercials. They were never in magazines. So this girl said, I feel like this sends a clear message that women cook and men work. So that's why everyone was so happy when they came out with this gender neutral Easy Bake Oven. So let's get into some of the very scary accidents that happened with the Easy Bake Oven. Because as you can imagine, it's an oven, it's hot, things are going to happen. In February of 2007, they recalled over a million Easy Bake Ovens. A million! This is because there were a few hundred reports of kids getting their fingers stuck in the door of the oven while it was on. And obviously that causes severe burns. There was this one poor five-year-old girl who got her hand caught in the door of the oven and the burns were so bad that they had to amputate some of her fingers. 
Ugh, I feel so bad for her. Like, how does that stuff happen? The specific model that was recalled was made of purple and pink plastic, and it resembled a kitchen oven with four burners on top and a front-loading oven. So basically, people who returned their Easy Bake Oven were given a $32 voucher to buy another one. But I mean, these accidents were all over the news, all over the newspapers. People were really freaking out, and I think that was part of their downfall and why why they're not being made anymore is because of these particular accidents. Now this next thing I'm going to show you is the creepiest thing ever. Are you ready? So there was an Easy Bake Oven comic strip that came out. Now it looks like just by the style of the drawing and the look of the comic strip, it probably came out many, many years ago, back when the Easy Bake Oven first came out. It's called The Phantom Strikes, and it's basically about this father who is watching his daughter use the Easy Bake Oven, but in the pictures, he's like hiding in the darkness, just watching her play with it. So I'm gonna read you this comic strip, and I'm sorry if it's blurry. It's a very, very old comic, so I can only find kind of pixelated pictures. Bear with me. So, it's called The Phantom Strikes. I just add water and mix it up. I just love my new Kenner Betty Crocker Easy Bake Oven. It's so easy to bake a yummy cake. Look at the eyes in the background watching her play with the Easy Bake Oven. That's her father. <laughs> That's so creepy. My cake will be done in 12 minutes. Watch cake bake through magic window when oven is on. You can still see the eyes in the background of her father watching her in the darkness. Hey mom, come see my cake I baked with the Easy Bake Oven. My cake's gone. That darn Billy did it again. I'll tell dad. So like, she thinks her brother was the one who stole the cake, but it was her dad. Why daddy, you're the phantom, and all the time I thought it was Billy. Here honey, bake some more Betty Crocker goodies for the phantom. So this father just watches his kid make cakes and then steals them from her. Why? Why was this a comic that was actually released. Okay, let's look at some easy bake oven fails because there are so many all over the internet because making these cakes aren't as easy as it seems. It's not really an easy bake oven. So first we have these cake pops which look so nicely made on the package but they turn out looking like dog poop. <laughs> then we have this brownie that's supposed to be really thick and juicy, but it's really just flat, almost like a pop tart. This happened to me all the time. My cakes were supposed to be this thick, but they ended up being this thick. Then we have the Easy Bake Gourmet Tacos, which just looks like a pile of sludge, to be honest. Doesn't look that appetizing. And then we have cookies that are supposed to be nice and round and pretty looking, but they don't. They look not good. So, Lunchables. This was definitely my favorite childhood lunch, and I feel like whenever you went to school and you had a Lunchable, you were automatically like the cool kid for the day. Everybody looked at you with jealousy. Everybody watched you eat your lunch and drooled on their desk wishing they were you. And I know it sounds dramatic, but admit it, people who brought their Lunchables to school were praised. <laughs> No, I just feel like everybody wanted that lunch, you know what I mean? We had this tradition where every Friday, my mom would pack my sister and I a Lunchable. So we only got it on Fridays if we were good. If we were bad that week, we didn't really get Lunchables, so that was like our punishment. But we always had four different ones that we kind of alternated between, and there's like 30 different Lunchables, but we only got like four different ones. So we would always have the hot dog ones, which were honestly my favorite. It was a little bit weird that the hot dogs were cold, but I liked them anyway. We had the pizza ones, which were like a classic one. But what was weird about me is I would never put the sauce on the pizza. I would never use the sauce. I would just take the little crust. I would just put cheese on top and pepperoni. And while I was eating it, it would fall everywhere because there was no sauce, but that was just my weirdness. We would have the crackers with ham and cheese. I feel like that's also like a classic one. And lastly, we would have the nacho one. I never liked salsa, so I only had the cheese. And I feel like that one was never really too filling. That was probably my least favorite one. But comment down below right now, what was your favorite Lunchable? Because there are so many out there in this world. So let's start from the beginning. Let's go way back in time to when Lunchables were first invented. I cannot believe I'm making a video about Lunchables. I feel like other 
YouTubers might watch this and be like, wow, did Jessie actually lose her mind? Like, does she not have content anymore? No, this is the best content. I love nostalgic things. So this is how they started. Lunchables came out in 1985 because moms were complaining that they didn't have enough time to make their children lunches to bring to school. So there was this huge like complaint from moms all around the world and Oscar Mayer, which is the Lunchables brand, heard their complaints and was like, hey, we know what to make. <laughs> so that's when they came out with Lunchables, which is pre-made lunches. I say lunches because they're kind of processed and just kind of thrown together in a factory, but you know. Now I want to tell you guys some rejected Lunchables names because when they first came out with this brand, they didn't know what to call it. So before they called it Lunchables, here were the runner-ups. <laughs> Entrees, Cracker Witches, Okay. Mini meals, square meals, walk meals, go packs, fun meals, and the weirdest one of them all, smoothie kebabbles. Smoothie kebabbles. So I think in the end they came out with a pretty good name. So let's get into some crazy facts. So there was a huge uproar from people all around the world when Lunchables decided to remove their red sticks. Do you guys remember those little red Lunchable sticks that you use to like spread your pizza sauce and stuff? Well, I don't know if it was like a choking hazard or something, a hazard for children, but they got rid of that stick and people all around the world were absolutely angry. I don't know why I did this. It says that there are still people mourning the loss of this red stick. Rest in peace, red stick. Apparently there are like Facebook groups out there of people mourning this red stick. I think that's a bit extreme, but like that stick was definitely useful. Okay, let's talk about a Lunchable pack they came out with that was terrible and actually very harmful to your health. This is where like the creepy, scary part of the video comes in. <laughs> they came out with a line of Lunchables called Mac maxed out. I don't know if you guys remember this line of Lunchables. I personally don't, but I think it was out for a couple years or something. And this was a Lunchable pack aimed more towards adults. So maybe older teens and people just in their adult lives. Now here's what completely freaks me out to read. It says the maxed out pack ended up on the cancer projects list of the five worst packaged lunchbox meals in the world. They ended up on a cancer list. I mean, that's pretty Pretty disturbing if you ask me. I just spit all over my camera lens. That's disturbing as well. Apparently, if you sat down for lunch and ate this entire maxed out pack of Lunchables, it's like 30 times worse than eating a Big Mac. So that's like you going out and getting a ton of Big Macs and eating it in one sitting. It had 22 grams of fat. It was just packed with way too much you didn't need that much stuff in one sitting. So people were outraged when they found out about how terrible this was for you, and I'm pretty sure they got rid of this. I'm not certain, but I kind of hope they did. Then they came out with a line of Lunchables called Uploaded. And I think this one's still out there in the world, I'm not really sure. This was a Lunchables pack aimed towards teens. So not kids, not adults, teens. And they called this pack Uploaded to seem more relatable to millennials. Because think about it, we're always on our phones, we're always watching YouTube, we're always uploading stuff or watching stuff that was uploaded. So they thought, oh my gosh, let's name it Uploaded, we'll be so relatable. But I found the ingredient list on the internet and it's like long. It's like the entire size of like a Target receipt. There are hundreds of ingredients in a simple looking Lunchable pack. How could there be that many things? One word preservatives. But apparently this lunch pack did really well. So I can make fun of how relatable they think they are all I want. People are buying them. The next thing they came out with was a lunchable pack called Fun Fuel. Now this one, it didn't last very long, I don't think. This was supposed to be the healthy alternative to your normal Lunchables because people were complaining so much about them being so unhealthy. So they were like, hey, we'll make one that's actually kind of healthy. So you know that candy that you always got in your Lunchable? Well, they took that out. They tossed it and they replaced it with yogurt. And they also went for a healthier juice option. So instead of like Kool-Aid and Capri Sun, they put like a healthy juice box in there. But when they came out with this, nobody was buying them. Nobody was eating them. It actually brought their sales way, way down. So they got rid of it because people want to be unhealthy. <laughs> now there is a new line of Lunchables that is not out just yet, but they're coming out. And people are kind of freaking out in a good way about this. And they are called 
Brunchables. It comes with bacon and cheddar cheese, breakfast sausage and cheddar cheese or ham. There's different flatbreads you can eat like your eggs and bacon in. I mean, it's a, it's a brunch in a box. There's a miniature blueberry muffin for dessert. I mean, looking at it, yeah, it does look pretty cute, but definitely let me know your opinions about this down below. Now, this next one is kind of a conspiracy theory about Lunchables that I don't know if I really believe, but people on the internet seem to. In 2013, this report was released into the public and it said that teachers had begun to see a connection between Lunchables and negative behavioral issues in the classroom. So teachers were starting to say, hey, the kids that disturb my class the most are the ones who always eat Lunchables like every single day. An anonymous teacher said, this is her quote, more of my Lunchable kids create behavioral problems than any of my other kids. They take shortcuts, have poor attitudes, and seem to struggle socially. I also believe that the lack of nutrition makes it difficult for the kids to function. And this report was made and a whole bunch of teachers jumped on it and agreed. I don't know how much I believe this. I mean, I definitely agree that lack of nutrition can cause behavioral problems and there's really not much nutrition in the Lunchables. So if they have it every single day, I mean, I don't know. But that was like the whole conspiracy with the Lunchable thing, so. The next big craze all over the internet is that people are deep frying their Lunchables. Oh. There are a few videos out there on YouTube and the internet where people are doing this. Apparently it tastes good. I don't know if I would agree with that, but people are deep frying their Lunchables. The next thing is kind of funny and that is that Kendrick Lamar came out and said that he can't look at Lunchables anymore. He admitted that the only thing he ever used to eat was Lunchables. Like every single day, especially when he was touring, he was just eating Lunchables. He told a reporter, this is a quote, I ate so much of this in Europe. I got burned up. I didn't want to see another Lunchable for a long time. So they eventually made him sick because he was eating them so much. And like I said, there's not much nutrition though. This next fact is really disturbing. And that is that Kraft can only legally advertise five of their Lunchables. Basically to advertise a food product, you have to meet a minimum amount of health requirements because obviously you can't advertise something that's terrible for you or that will make you sick. So to advertise something on TV, online, it, the product has to meet certain health requirements. Well, what's disturbing is that Kraft has 42 Lunchables and only five meet those requirements. Take that in. And the last thing that I find so bizarre and it kind of says a lot and that is that the man who invented Lunchables won't even let his own kids eat them. So, I mean, it's just the, the meats in the Lunchables are pumped with a ton of water, a ton of preservatives. There's more salt in one Lunchables box than your daily recommended salt intake. So that's not very good for you. The ingredient list is like a paragraph long. And apparently this guy's daughter was interviewed and this is a quote she said when people asked if she ate Lunchables. She said, I eat healthy. <laughs> wow. In 1983, a Cabbage Patch Kids doll was a 16-inch doll, usually with a plastic head, a fabric body, and yarn hair. What made them so desirable were their uniqueness and their adoptability. It was claimed that every single Cabbage Patch doll was unique. There was none that looked exactly alike, which was so cool to people. Different head molds, eye shapes and colors, hairstyles, clothing options, and each Cabbage Patch Kids box came with a birth certificate. It made the dolls as individual as the kids who wanted to adopt them. And then on the left side of every single doll's butt cheek, you can find the signature of the inventor. And each year, the color of the signature would change. But I love how it was on like their butt cheek. <laughs> so let's get into some of the weird facts. Before they were called Cabbage Patch Kids, they were actually called the little people. When the creator Xavier Roberts began handcrafting them, in 1977, he referred to them as little people. And his marketing plan was really interesting. He told gift shops and other stores that they could never sell these dolls. They had to call it adopting. He also corrected anyone who referred to them as dolls. He preferred to call them babies or kids. So his marketing plan was that these dolls were actually just literal babies that you could adopt. Something 
something scary is that a lot of people got trampled trying to buy them. The 1983 holiday shopping season drove consumers into a frenzy. So people would literally line up outside of these doors selling a very limited quantity of Cabbage Patch Kids. And the second the doors would open, people would just fly in just like Black Friday. It says there was a stampede throughout the stores. People suffered broken bones. They were trampled. People were trying to bribe employees to get them a doll earlier than the store opened. It says there was a manager who had to get a baseball bat to scare the crowd away because people were trampling each other that much. There was a lot of hospital visits that Christmas. This next fact is so creepy. There was this one Cabbage Patch Kids doll model that had to be recalled because it ate a kid's hair. It ate a kid's hair. So they basically released these dolls called Snack Time Kids. I'm pretty sure I've mentioned these dolls on my channel at some point. But basically, they were made to gobble fake french fries. But there were a bunch of cases where this mouth moving mechanism would grab onto a kid's hair and continue to eat it. It says there was literally a 911 call for a child in Connecticut who was unable to free herself from the kid's mouth. So the company offered refunds, there was a bunch of dolls that were recalled, and kids were basically traumatized because you don't want to bring a doll home from a store and have it literally eat your hair. This next thing I find really creepy and that is that Cabbage Patch dolls have death certificates. So just like they have birth certificates, they also die and get a certificate. So basically dolls are easily broken. They either get too old, worn out, pets will eat them, they get walked on, they get dirty. Dolls get ruined. Now apparently there are doll hospitals out there that take in Cabbage Patch Kids and do fix them up the best they can, but sometimes these dolls are just too destroyed and factories can't fix them. So whenever this happens, they send you back your doll with a death certificate. It says if your kid was beyond Repair, they would issue the toy a death certificate. Imagine thinking your doll is being fixed at a doll hospital and it comes home with a death certificate. Again. This next fact is also really creepy. Surprise, surprise! Cabbage Patch Kids are born at Babyland General Hospital. Now, they're not born like regular babies. They literally grow out of a cabbage patch. There are pictures out there of these cabbage patches with just heads popping out of them. It says it is one of Georgia's top tourist attractions and is featured on Travel Channel's top 10 toylands in the world. And people have said that it is is mildly disturbing to watch because you're just not, you're not ready for it, you know? The next fact is that Cabbage Patch Kids did go to space. They actually send a lot of toys out to space, it seems. In 1985, Christopher became the first Cabbage Patch Kid to fly aboard a US space shuttle mission. I just find it so interesting that they actually send toys to space. Okay, let's talk about the creepiest Cabbage Patch dolls ever sold. And yes, the snack time ones are pretty scary, but apparently people think that the ones I'm about to talk about are even scarier. These ones are called Baby So Real. It's a Bluetooth controlled doll that has wide animated LCD eyes that blink and close. It burps, it laughs, and it even snores while falling asleep. It does everything. It talks, it drinks from a bottle, it slurps medicine from a spoon, it plays peekaboo, which is terrifying. It wets itself even. So basically you buy this doll and you care for it with this downloadable app. So this whole doll is completely electronic and I think the most complaints from people is about the eyes. The eyes really freak people out. It says, even if your child loves the toy, it's understandable why you can't shake this creepy feeling that it might be watching you. <gasps> In most of the articles I read, it's the parents <laughs> that are afraid. I mean, if my child wanted something like that, I would stay far away from it, I think. The next thing is that they have celebrity Cabbage Patch dolls, which I find kind of cool. They have Steven Tyler, Katherine Hagel, Raven Simone, Ellen DeGeneres. Some people find this idea really cool and other people find it a little bit odd. I mean, I don't know how I would feel about seeing myself as a Cabbage Patch doll. I feel like their faces are kind of 
puffy and stuff. So like we usually do, we're gonna talk about the most rare Cabbage Patch dolls. So in case you have one at home, these are selling for a lot of money. First, we have James Dudley from 1985, and that is selling for $3,000. Then we have Blonde Girl Little People doll from 1981 selling for $2,000. Then we have the Mark Twain collection selling for $850. The Fraternal Twins Irish Edition, $750. Maureen Miriam from 1978 for 350 Southern Belle Georgiana 1986 for 249 Designer Line Cabbage Patch Kids 1989 for $200 and then lastly we have Boyce Lorenzo from 1985 for $200 so it seems like the ones that are the rarest go for $3,000 that's insane I once again sold mine in a garage sale so <laughs> could have been rich it just goes to show you that you should never throw out your toys because maybe some toys that you have now will be so much money in like 2050. Imagine that. Time is a weird, weird thing. Created by Yuko Shimizu, Hello Kitty made her debut in 1974. She's known for her red bow and notably no mouth whatsoever. According to her backstory, she is a third grade student who lives outside of London. I think that's one of the things that I found most confusing as a child watching her TV shows and stuff. Why did she not have a mouth? Since the character's creation, Hello Kitty has become a media franchise, including a product line of clothing, toys, Boys, manga comics, popular music, and a bunch of other media. I'm pretty sure any store you walk into will probably have something Hello Kitty themed. It's just everywhere. Hello Kitty is the second highest grossing franchise of all time. It has generated 80 billion sales. 80 billion. What's really cool is that Hello Kitty's first appearance ever in this world was on a little tiny coin purse. This purse was sold in Japan and it pictured her sitting between a bottle of milk and a goldfish bowl. So the second people saw this little coin purse, they loved her right away. So let's get into some weird facts about about Hello Kitty that maybe you never knew before. So her birthday is November 1st, which makes her a Scorpio, for those of you horoscope fanatics. Her full name is actually Kitty White. Interesting. There is a Hello Kitty theme park in China that got a ton of negative reviews at first. This theme park looks so cool, but when it first came out, people just didn't like it for some reason, but now it's actually doing a lot better. There are actually so many proposals that happen there, so it's a cool park. So I'm gonna answer one of the most asked questions about Hello Kitty and that is why doesn't she have a mouth? According to the creator, she doesn't have a mouth so that people who look at her can project their own feelings onto her face. So Hello Kitty will look happy when you're happy. Hello Kitty will look sad when you're sad. Hello Kitty will look angry if you're angry. It's actually really freaky but it's all a mind trick according to the creator. However you feel is how Hello Kitty will look to you. Isn't that kind of creepy? The creator says, for this psychological reason, we thought that she shouldn't be tied to any certain emotion, and that is why she does not have a mouth. Wow, so it's almost like Hello Kitty is brainwashing us. A next weird fact is that Hello Kitty is in space. A Hello Kitty figurine was launched into space on a small Japanese satellite. The launch cost 40 million dollars. Wow, I hope Hello Kitty was worth it. The next fact really shocks people, and it did for me as well. It is that Hello Kitty is not actually a kitty. In fact, she is not a cat at all. This is what the maker of Hello Kitty says. This is an actual quote. Hello Kitty is not a cat. She's a cartoon character. She is a little girl. She is a friend, but she is not a cat. She's never depicted on all fours. She walks and sits like a two-legged creature. She is a human. I can't say I see it. When I saw this, I was like, wait, what? No. She's a cat. She's a, she's, she's Hello Kitty, but apparently not. The next really weird thing is that there are creepy Hello Kitty contact lenses. The reason why I say creepy is because it shows people wearing Hello Kitty all inside of their eyes. I mean, do whatever you want. Your style is your style and I'm okay with that. It's just that there were a lot of reports of these contact lenses actually causing 
causing like infections and stuff. So it says this is for only the most hardcore of fans, but this seems like an ill-advised idea. And the fact that it's out there is kind of dangerous. I wonder if it'd be weird to look out of. Like, would you see Hello Kitty in your vision? <laughs> the next fact that I found so strange is that she has a twin sister. I did not know that. She has a sister named Mimi who looks really similar to her. And apparently the reason why Hello Kitty wears a red bow is so that her mother can tell her apart from her sister. It says the bows they wear are a gesture from their mother, Mary. So she's able to tell Kitty White apart from her sister, Mimi. So wow, their mother can't even tell who is who. That's interesting. Now let's talk about the creepy backstory behind Hello Kitty. This is an urban legend and isn't said to be actually true, but so many people around the world do believe this and it is very creepy. So according to the legend, there was this mother who had a child and unfortunately this child was diagnosed with mouth cancer. The doctors told this mother that her child was terminally ill and there was nothing else they could do for her, aka she didn't have much time left to live. So this mother refused to give up hope and wanted to try everything in her power to heal her child and eventually that led her to make a pact with evil forces. The pact was that if these evil forces cured her child's illness, she in return would have to create a cartoon character that kids around the world would love, but that secretly resembled something more evil to kind of represent that evil force. I know it's a little bit confusing, I'm so sorry. And it says that's why Hello Kitty's ears look like horns and why she doesn't have a mouth because of what happened to her child. There was even a rumor going around that Kitty is a Chinese word meaning demon, but it's not actually. I don't know how that rumor even started. But basically the creepypasta is that Hello Kitty is a spawn of evil. So, and because of this creepy backstory, so many people around the world have created creepy Hello Kitty fan art. There's also a bunch of Hello Kitty horror characters, so it's just her dressing up as different freaky people from horror movies. There's a depiction of Hello Kitty playing Jack Skellington, Frankenstein, Edward Scissorhands, the Joker, a vampire, a zombie. If you go on Google, you could probably find her dressed up as pretty much anything. The next scary thing, is that there is a Sadako Kitty. I hope I'm saying that right, I'm so sorry. In promotion for the new Ring movie, many viewers of this film were thoroughly terrified by the image of Sadako with her dark long hair covering her face coming out of a television. So to promote this movie, they decided to make Hello Kitty into Sadako. So they combined Sadako's trademark dress and long black hair with Hello Kitty's ribbons. And this scary Hello Kitty went on all kinds of merchandise and people really loved it. And the last thing we're gonna talk about is a creepy Duracell ad that came out. Duracell is that battery brand, by the way. But this ad came out to the public and it really upset children. This ad showed basically the skeleton of Hello Kitty with the tagline that says, toys should live forever. Meaning that if you don't replace a toy's batteries, they will die. And that's how they were picturing Hello Kitty. But what confuses me is that Hello Kitty doesn't need batteries, does she? Like, why is that on the Duracell ad? But kids were like, no, don't kill Hello Kitty. I think it's kind of a cool ad, to be honest. Let's start off with the most extreme theory that I don't personally believe, but a lot of people on the internet do. It is that the hearts, the little hearts you put into your Build-A-Bear are actually tracking devices and listening devices. So it's like a whole government scheme because as you know, most kids have a Build-A-Bear and if you put those hearts inside of it, well, there you go. You're automatically tracked. Plus when you go in and you make a bear, you have to go into their data registry thing. So everybody who has a bear, they have your phone number, they have your full name, they have your address, they have everything about you in their big database. I love how it says, if you are going to try to take over the world, Build-A-Bear has the way to do it. <laughs> so I think that's sort of a very extreme theory that I don't really believe. So we're gonna get into some other facts that are kind of upsetting and somewhat creepy and somewhat disturbing. Get ready. So there was this one time that Build-A-Bear had a huge promotion that they had never done before 
before and it was called pay your age day. So basically if you go into the store on this day, the only amount you have to pay for the bear is how old you are. So if you're two years old, the bear is $2. If you're 13 years old, the bear is $13, etc. And because bears typically cost, I believe anywhere between $20 to $60, depending on which bear and depending on what accessories you're getting, this was like a really amazing deal because most people who get a Build-A-Bear, they're under 20 years old. So people were freaking out about this huge promotion. And I don't think Build-A-Bear was prepared for it because the day of the promotion, there were lines all through the malls everywhere. And it was a seven hour wait line. So the entire mall was packed with people, parents with their kids, waiting to go to this pay your age event. People were getting trampled. There were security issues. The store was basically being mobbed with people. So only a couple hours into the event, they had to completely shut it down. And people all over the world drove like hours and hours to get to these stores to pay their age. And build a totally shut down the promotion. People were furious. It was all over the news because some kids got to get their Build-A-Bears and other kids didn't. Oh my goodness, it was a mess. But I mean, who makes a promotion like that? Obviously, it's not gonna go well. I mean, what if like a one-year-old comes in? A Build-A-Bear's one dollar? The next thing we're gonna talk about is another Build-A-Bear event gone wrong. And this part makes me absolutely furious. So there was this mother who hosted a Build-A-Bear birthday party for her daughter. Now for this birthday party, this mother got a whole bunch of these kids, like a huge group, like 10 kids, to go into the Build-A-Bear store, buy themselves a bear, get it stuffed, get it all decorated and dressed. And so all these kids were so excited, so happy, they're celebrating this birthday. But on their way out of the Build-A-Bear store, this mother of the birthday girl stopped all the kids and she was like, okay, everybody hand over your bears to my daughter because it's her birthday. And all the kids were like, what do you mean? Like, no, these are our bears. We just made them. We just paid for them. And the mother was like, no, it's my daughter's birthday. So all of you guys are going to give her your bears that you made as a birthday gift. And these kids started crying. And this mother was literally grabbing the bears out of these kids' arms, like just taking it right from them. It was a whole commotion. The news got involved. It was like the whole world knew about this birthday party gone wrong for Build-A-Bear. I mean, the parents of these kids were so mad. Who does that? I mean, I get that your kid is the birthday girl, but like, do you not want her to have friends anymore? Because do you really think she's gonna go to school the next day and all these kids that she stole their bears from are gonna be happy to like hang out with her? I just don't get it, guys. This next fact is kind of creepy and it was a Build-A-Bear that was actually recalled. So it was pulled off the market because bad things were happening with it. This bear was called the Colorful Hearts Teddy Bear. Hopefully none of you guys have this out there. Please let me know. But basically these kids were taking this particular teddy bear home with them and the eyes would pop out. Like the eyes weren't sewn in correctly so they would be like snuggling with it or playing with it and the eyes would just be like Pfft. It was scaring kids because no one wants to see their beloved teddy bear with their eyes falling out and also it was a choking hazard for the kids that were really young who had this bear because they see an eye pop out and they're like oh that must be candy. So it was a hazard to children and they had to recall this and the thing is 300,000 people had already purchased it and taken it home. So 300,000 people had to bring it back into the store for this recall. I mean, that's insane. Why are these teddy bears eyes popping out? The next thing we're gonna talk about is the secrets that Build-A-Bear employees won't tell you. I'm pretty sure I found this in an article online from somebody who used to work at Build-A-Bear and they put like all these facts down. So we're gonna go over a few of them. The first one is that all of the staff in Build-A-Bear call the empty bears skins. So you know before you stuff your bear, you get the bear like all flat and empty? Well, all the staff calls those skins, the skins of the Build-A-Bears. <laughs> That's like so scary. Why can't they just call them unstuffed bears? The next creepy thing is that the sound machine in the store will just go off randomly even when no kid is pressing a button. So staff will like walk by it, it'll suddenly turn on and like make them jump. So staff were always just anxious waiting to know when the sound machine would suddenly start. That would just give me major like panic while I was working there. The next fact that I had no idea is that if your kid is having a Build-A-Bear birthday party, you can pay to have one of the staff from the store dress up as a giant Build-A-Bear and then go to your kid's party. I had no idea that was a thing. And honestly, that's kind of like 
kind of creepy. The next fact is that those boxes that you take your Build-A-Bear home in was actually inspired by Happy Meals. So the owner of Build-A-Bear was like, oh my gosh, I love how kids get like cool little packages for Happy Meals. I want the same thing for Build-A-Bear. So they made the boxes like colorable. They made them full of different like images and stuff. So that's why the boxes are so cute because McDonald's. The next fact is super creepy. It was about a commercial that came out for Build-A-Bear that scared kids kids all around the world and like parents were complaining so much about this commercial they actually had to like get rid of it. It was basically this video on global warming which I mean to talk about global warming I think that's awesome but it was like the way they went about it. It was basically this series that came out in 2009 that showed a Santa Claus freaking out about global warming. Like he even says the North Pole will be gone by Christmas. Basically saying bye kids no more Santa Claus Claus if we keep having global warming. So kids were like crying, they were freaking out about Christmas basically being cancelled. And so the company got really criticized by parents everywhere saying, oh my gosh, stop scaring my kid. So they agreed to remove the videos. And like I said, talking about global warming I think is very important. But I think when you're talking to kids, there's like a different way to go about it rather than saying, hey, Santa Claus is gonna die. This next fact is so cute. Oh my gosh. So there is this baby monkey in an England zoo and its mother was unfortunately too ill to care for it so the mother had to go away to get like medical care so Build-A-Bear stuffed this monkey and put a heart into the bear that actually like moved to simulate like a real monkey and so this baby monkey would curl up to this Build-A-Bear monkey for days and days until it got older and that was how like it grew up healthy so that's kind of cute and the last fact I feel like a lot of you guys might know about because I have seen this circling social media and I do find it to be kind of a touching thing to do. So basically tons of people around the world, thousands of people in fact, have been putting the voices of their relatives that have passed away into a Build-A-Bear because you can put like a recording of a voice or a song into a bear and it just like stays in your bear forever. And I think that's like a really sweet thing to do. The only sad thing is what if it runs out of batteries one day? I I mean, I think the Build-A-Bear policy says that if your thing runs out, you can go back and like get it fixed. I'm not too sure about that though. But some people like speak out and say that's kind of weird. But honestly, like if that's what you wanna do, like you do you. I think it's kind of touching. People have been coming out lately talking about what happens when you open a jar of Play-Doh that's been sitting out for like five to eight years. This means you have not opened it at all. It has not been played with in years. They start growing what is called sodium chloride crystals. People have also been giving them the name the alien spores. What? You're telling me my old Play-Doh might have alien spores? And there's a logical explanation for this, okay? Play-Doh is made of flour, water, salt, a binding agent, preservatives, and fragrances. So what's been happening inside these little containers is that the water has completely evaporated, which makes salt crystals form. And people are totally freaking out about this because kids all over the world are opening Play-Doh after three years and seeing this crazy crystal-y thing inside of them, and they're wondering, is it toxic? Is it safe? Should we not touch it? Should we not smell it? And there's this huge rumor going around. It's on Reddit. It's like everywhere that these crystals are actually, um, they can explode in the bottle. I have a feeling that's not exactly true. I feel like once people see something weird and unusual like alien spores, they make up things like, hey kids, these might explode. But yeah, I don't think that's true. I do actually have scientists in my family. I feel like I should ask them. But people are saying that because this Play-Doh can grow such magnificent weird things, it's proof that Play-Doh Play-Doh is not actually edible like they claim it is. And that's why lately a lot of moms have been making homemade Play-Doh because they're making it with ingredients that they think kids can consume. But little do they know, if you make homemade Play-Doh, that might actually be more toxic than actual Play-Doh. And I'll tell you why. I feel like all of a sudden I'm like Bill Nye the science guy. <laughs> Jess, 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 Jess. Jess and he talks Play-Doh. <laughs> Wow. So apparently when you make homemade Play-Doh, you put 
so much salt into the recipe. It says that one gram of the average homemade Play-Doh recipe contains 250 milligrams of salt, and that is way higher than commercial Play-Dohs. So it says that if your child eats even four grams of Play-Doh, they can get severely ill. If anybody swallows a lot of salt, it's really toxic in your body. People have like died from that. Especially like a little toddler that can't handle as much as adults can. It's just not a good, not a good situation. Anyways though, basically these alien spores growing on old Play-Doh, it's it's salt, so don't be too alarmed, but I would just toss those ones if you ever find those ones. Throw them out. Throw them out. Before we move on, I just wanna tell you guys a very interesting fact, and that is that Play-Doh was originally a wall cleaner. <laughs> A wall cleaner. Basically back in the 1920s, coal burning furnaces were like a huge thing, obviously. But whenever you burned coal, the walls of your house would go like a dark black color, especially if your walls were white. So these people came out with Play-Doh that you basically put on the wall and it would clean off the black coal from your wall. And then apparently in the 1950s, there was this school teacher that made her students create Christmas ornaments out of this Play-Doh wall cleaner. And they saw, hey, oh my gosh, kids love this product, so they changed it into the Play-Doh that you know and love now. So it went from a wall cleaner to edible stuff that kids play with. I don't know if that's safe, but apparently it is. There is an urban legend surrounding Beanie Babies that really used to freak me out when I first heard about it. I feel like 98% of you guys probably have heard of this urban legend, but we're gonna like delve deep. We're gonna delve deep into it right now. There was a rumor that back in the 90s, spider eggs were used to fill the Beanie Babies. You know when you squeeze a Beanie Baby, you feel like little bead type things in their tummy? Their tummies are squishy? Well, there was a rumor going around that those were brown recluse spider eggs that were inside of them. Do you know what those spiders look like? They are absolutely horrifying. I would never want those eggs inside of my Beanie Baby. So it was basically said that if you bought your Beanie Baby in 1990, those eggs were inside. And then in 2014, an article started circling the internet, basically saying that the spider eggs were starting to hatch. I'm gonna read you exactly what the article says because you need to hear this. For nearly two decades now, your Beanie Babies have served as protective sacks for the spider eggs they harbor, providing a warm, dark atmosphere for the anthropods to pass through their larval stages. Is this science class? Each Beanie Baby is stuffed with approximately 6,000 spider eggs. Though, unless you've been storing them in a secure, low humidity environment, you should realistically only expect between 800 to 1,000 spiders to spawn through your Beanie Baby's fabric. Only, only 800 to 1,000 to spawn. Now, this article was being shared everywhere, all over Facebook, all of the parents were getting this, and people believed it, and people went into a full-blown panic. People were throwing out their Beanie Babies left, right, and center. People were worried because some people couldn't find their Beanie Babies. Some people had them packed away in their storage in the basement. So they were worried they wouldn't get to them on time and they'd have a full-blown spider infestation in their house. The article continues, all right? It's terrifying. Aren't sure if your Beanie Baby has released its spiders yet? Well, you'll know your Beanie's fur is about to tear open when you see hundreds of spider legs start piercing through the fabric in an effort to escape. You might even notice little Pugsley or Bongo lurching forward inch by inch as the spiders collectively attempt to break free from their snuggly resting place. Ugh. I'm so disturbed right now. This article was obviously fake news. It was an article written to Triangle Viral. It was a troll on the internet trying to freak everybody out. Honestly, when I first heard about this back in 2014, I kind of believed it at first. I mean, it's a pretty believable article when you read it for the first time. But just so you know, it, it wasn't true, okay? Snopes even debunked it, and like Snopes is like a pretty reliable site, I would say, right? I'm pretty sure I know. Because if you think about it logically, brown recluse spider eggs don't just lay dormant for 20 years. When a spider lays its eggs, they hatch within one to two weeks. I'm pretty sure. Let me check that information just so I know. Oh, these little eggs usually hatch about a month after they're laid, so it doesn't take them 20 years to suddenly just like 
like spawn spiders. And secondly, the manufacturer, Ty, released a statement saying that what's inside the Beanie Babies are just small plastic pellets. What's ironic though is that there is a Beanie Baby named Eggs the Bear, but it's for Easter. It's, it's an Easter bear. I love how the manufacturer is named Ty and my fiance's name is Ty, so this whole video I'm gonna be saying Ty and like thinking about him, but it's actually Beanie Babies. Anyways, so now we're gonna talk about the most disturbing and controversial Beanie Babies because believe it or not, there are controversial Beanie Babies. This is kind of like the McDonald's Happy Meal toy video because they had like controversial ones that were pulled. Well, these guys did too. The first one is Luau the Pig. I really hope I'm pronouncing this right. If I'm not, don't hate me. I just really suck at pronunciations. This pig is named after the ancient Hawaiian feast in which a pig is roasted over an open fire as the main course. So people thought this was a bit strange because it's almost like naming a cow ham hamburger, you know what I mean? You're like naming him his fate, which is kind of horrible. Okay, the next controversial bear is called Billionaire the Bear. So in 1998, Ty made two billion dollars just from selling Beanie Babies. It still sounds like I'm talking about my fiance. He didn't make two billion dollars from Beanie Babies. <laughs> The company did. So in celebration of them making billions of dollars, they came out with this bear that had a dollar sign and it was called Billionaire the Bear and they gave them out to all of their employees and also sold them in the stores. So employees felt kind of bad about this because the company is showing off how much money they made and the employees are slaving away selling these Beanie Babies, not even making near that. And here they are with this bear that's like, ha. Huh? I made a billion dollars and you didn't. And from 1998 to 2006, every year they came out with a new billionaire bear that they would give out to people. And it just, it didn't sit well with the employees. It says, there's nothing employees love more than a physical reminder that they're working to help some other person make millions of dollars they'll never see. I mean, yeah, it sucks. The next controversial Beanie Babies were called Smart, Smarter, Smartest, and Smarty the Owls. So these four owls were released every single grade graduating year. So Smart was released in 2001, Smarter was released in 2002, etc, etc. So every year the owls had like a smarter name. So each graduating class before felt dumber than the ones after them. Does that make sense? So students were feeling a bit offended by this, but I mean, I don't know guys, they're just Beanie Babies. The next bear was called Poopsie the Bear. Who does this look like to you guys? A lot of people were saying this was a huge ripoff of Winnie the Pooh, and I mean Winnie the Pooh, Poopsie the Bear, Pooh and Poopsie, it's all about poop here. <laughs> Anyways, people were like, wow, you're literally copying Winnie the Pooh. So this bear kind of got a bad rep, and uh, I mean, I, I see the similarities here. The next bear that didn't go so well was Pinata the Bear. If you give kids a toy, that is named Pinata, they're automatically gonna beat it and try and get out what's ever inside of it. So kids were given this bear and they would try and destroy it thinking there was candy inside. But there wasn't. There was either spider eggs or little beads. <laughs> no, there's no spider eggs. <laughs> This next Beanie Baby really creeped people out. It was called Runner the Mongoose. And just looking at it, it looks totally fine. But when you read what's inside the little heart card, you'll uh, you'll see why. On its tag, it had this. I'm not so mean, I'm really shy, but every cobra has to die. I'll grab them by their little head and whack them till they're stone cold dead. Imagine giving a kid that. I mean, <laughs> a lot of parents weren't too impressed by this little tag and it's so bizarre how they would write that because aren't Beanie Babies supposed to be like really cute and sweet and like not saying stuff like that? <laughs> and the last bear I'm gonna talk about also really creeped people out. It was a bear called the end, just the end. And this is what the description of the bear says. He is the Omega of Beanie Babies, the one who comes to destroy all that has come before. He is undefeatable. He is implacable. He is death. He is the end of all things Beanie. Okay! Obviously the company Ty didn't write that. It was just this person, I guess, in an article wrote that. But like, who names a Beanie Baby the end? What occasion can you give somebody that? Like when they're dying? Like, we're gonna end off this video with some weird facts about Beanie Babies. The first fact is that a couple actually went to court about their Beanie Babies. So it was this married couple. They had a huge collection of Beanie Babies. They wanted to get a divorce. So they had to go to court to try and evenly split up their Beanie Babies. 
babies. They went to court over their beanie babies. It says their collection had a value of $5,000, so okay, you know what? They did have a large collection, I get that. But can't you sort that out between the two of you? You know what I mean? Give both of them an equal amount of beanie babies, problem solved. But they had to actually take this to court with a jury, with witnesses. It Come on guys. The next fact, remember how like everybody in your life told you that you can't tear off the tag on the Beanie Baby? Well, that is because if you ever tried to sell it in the future, Beanie Babies were worth 50% less if you tore off the tag. So they're just more valuable with that red heart on their ear. And the last weird fact is that Ty once made a typo on the Beanie Baby tag. It was on a little white bear called Valentino and some of the tags spell original wrong. They spell it with two eyes on the tag. And because a typo had never been made before on a Beanie Baby, these bears are now worth a lot of money. They're super rare and worth a lot. So if you have little, what is his name? Little white bear Valentino, <laughs> and he has two eyes in original, you can be earning some cash. So here's the first fact that I find so strange, and that's the first My Little Pony toy wasn't little at all. So before My Little Pony was called My Little Pony, it was called My Pretty Pony. It was actually a larger 10 inch sized horse. It came out in 1981, so quite a while ago. It had brushable hair, the ears would wiggle, she could move her tail, she could blink, so she did quite a lot of stuff. But one thing that was kind of unfortunate is she only came came in one color. So she never came in pink, purple, blue, all kinds of pretty colors. So a few years later, they decided to completely change that design. They made them smaller, made them more colorful. And then the first cartoon aired in 1986. It used to be called My Little Pony and Friends because the first half of the episode would be about My Little Pony and the second half of the episode would be about some other toy product. For example, Mr. Potato Head and his family. So My Little Pony Pony never had an actual full episode. It was always sharing with another toy. You know what I mean? I also had no idea that Mr. Potato Head had its own like show. <laughs> That's so funny to me. It says it's apparently a bunch of little potato children being watched over by Mr. Potato Head. Why would that be interesting? I have absolutely no idea. A show about potatoes. This next fact is very, very weird, okay? In 1989, Hasbro came out with a very strange My Little Pony line. They were called called drink and wet ponies. Drink and wet. That's such a weird thing. It's basically about baby My Little Ponies who are wearing diapers and whenever you get the diaper wet, let's say you bring it into the pool or bring it into the bath, their diapers will change color. There'll be hearts all over it. There'll be patterns all over their diapers, but it won't happen unless you get it wet. So basically the baby pony will pee into the diaper and it'll change the diaper color. <laughs> I don't know why I keep doing this with my hands. It says that the magical hearts that appear here on their diapers are supposed to represent when you go number one and when you go number two. So instead of poop, we got some hearts. So I guess, you know, that's better than poop. I just want to know who's pitching these ideas though. Like it's so random. Please let me know if you remember having those diaper My Little Pony toys. <laughs> I kind of want to see this in action though. Like I kind of want to see if there's YouTube videos that'll show how it actually works. <laughs> this next fact is something that I definitely remember. When My Little Pony first came out, there were only six ponies and these were the six original ponies and I had these as a kid growing up. The ponies names were Snuzzle, Butterscotch, Bluebell, Mint, Tea, Blossom and Cotton Candy and these were all produced in 1982 and yes I wasn't born in the 80s but when I was in the 90s I think these toys were still really popular and like my older cousins would pass them down to me to play with so these are the ponies that I remember as a child and when these six ponies came out they were called the Flatfoots and that's because these were the only ponies that had this pose it says they have flat feet rather than concave feet their heads are facing forward and down and this pose for the ponies was never used again after that year. So any My Little Pony toy you see after them has a totally different pose. Now just like Beanie Babies where you can have a rare Beanie Baby to sell for a lot of money, there are also rare My Little Ponies. Apparently if you have a Rapunzel Pony that is going for $800. Apparently there are a bunch of Venezuelan My Little Ponies that are selling for a lot of money. There are also a collection of Greek My Little Ponies that are selling on 
eBay for $750. So it says that every few years, a new rare My Little Pony will like pop up, especially if they were made in other places around the world. But like, I wanna Rapunzel My Little Pony. What like, do you know what sucks? When I was really little and I was kind of growing out of all of my toys, I think I sold each of my My Little Ponies for like $1. I don't know if they'd be worth more now because I definitely had the ones from the 80s. But when I was a kid, I just wanted that $1, you know? You know when you're a kid and like one or two dollars is just so much money to you? I also sold my Nintendo DS for like 50 cents and like serious regrets now. The next fact is like really cool but also really creepy but I'm so intrigued. There are different artists online that sell their own versions of My Little Pony on like Etsy and stuff. So they take a pony and turn it into like an actor, a character from a movie, an alien, a zombie. So there are a bunch of artists online who are so talented but they kind of turn My Little Pony into something creepier and weirder. So for example, you can find a xenomorph My Little Pony, which is obviously a really creepy alien. You can also find a pony that's been turned into the Joker from Batman. So you can probably find any character from a movie who's been turned into a pony, which is funny, but like awesome and creepy, but also cool. There's so many emotions at the same time. The next fact is kind of scary, but mostly for children. And it's that when the show first came out, like way, way back in the 80s, the children were really afraid of the villains that they had on the show. So for example, there was a villain named Lord Tyrek, and he was in the very first animated TV special. So while the ponies were really, really cute, this villain really made children afraid. A lot of parents were complaining, a lot of kids had nightmares, and it's because they made this villain to kind of look like a demon, like they gave him really big horns, they made him terrifying for a kid show. This villain apparently turned humans into demons, and actually forced the ponies to pull his chariot of midnight, so like he was making the pony slaves. So when the show first came out, it had a really dark undertone and gave a lot of kids nightmares. The last thing we're gonna talk about is actually kind of scary as well. There is a creepy pasta about Slenderman. It's kind of funny too, to be honest. So you guys know all about the creepy pasta about Slenderman. It's been scaring people for years and years. I'm pretty sure it came out in like 2008, 2009. He's depicted as a thin, unnaturally tall humanoid with a featureless head and face and wearing a black suit. He basically goes after children and it's just a really popular creepypasta. If you've never heard of Slenderman, pause this video and go look him up because there's so much you need to know. Anyways, people came up with Slenderman, which like I said, is the pony version of Slenderman. It says it started off as a fan fiction and since then it has inspired a ton of fan art about Slenderman. It says that some people even claim that Slenderman appears in the show. Some fans have slowed down and enhanced footage to show possible sightings of this slender pony. So some people claim this is a real thing in the show and some people just say no it's all made up it's all a fan thing.